My name is Orlin Zatarski. I'm a resident radiologist from Ajibat M City Clinic, Takuda Hospital in Sofia. And uh, my talk today is going to be about how and when of stroke patient triage. So some, a short review of the literature and some uh, practical applications. So uh, the layout of today's lecture, we're going to start talking about uh, the time from symptom onset, uh, some imaging criteria, the location of the large vessel occlusion, and stroke severity. So starting from uh, the time of symptom onset, of course, we divide stroke into two main categories. We divide them into the early time window, for now at least, and a late time window. So the early time window is uh, up to six hours. Of course, there's a lot of data supporting the use of thrombectomy within the zero to six uh, hour time frame. Uh, of course, this is versus uh, medical therapy. And uh, when I say good outcome, of course, I'm talking about the modified Rankin scale, zero to two. Uh, you can see Mr. Clean, Extend IA, Swift Prime, a number of trials showing the benefit of thrombectomy within this time, uh, time frame. Of course, Revascat and Escape take things a little bit further. We'll start talking about that right now. Uh, eight hours and 12 hours. So what about the later time window? Um, we have two groundbreaking trials that started appearing around 2018 uh, talking about beyond the six hour time frame that we've set. We have Diffuse 3 taking, taking matters up to 16 hours, again with, with uh, really good scores, and Dawn uh, up to 24 hours with, with good results. And we call this a late time window paradox, and it was only when we started incorporating more advanced imaging techniques such as CT perfusion, MR perfusion, that we started being able to explain why this happens. We have the early Hermes collaboration that comes up with, with the phrase, uh, time equals brain, and that's great. We love that phrase. It's our favorite thing to say. Uh, however, due to these advanced imaging techniques, we can start talking about a little bit of a paradigm shift, and can we start talking about collaterals equals brain? So the RCTs are great, uh, but what do the registries tell us? And this is important because RCTs are just that. They're controlled trials. Um, the benefits are the registries that I'm going to talk about, for example, TREC and NASA. There are a couple of others, but we'll talk about these two. Um, they have no specific restriction in time and no specific imaging criteria, which is what all these RCTs use. And it turns out that they have results that are really similar to the RCTs, 48 and 42 percent of good clinical outcome, again, based on uh, the modified Rankin scale. Uh, what was interesting and in support of the late time window was that 33% of registered patients had thermectomy above, so later than six hours from onset. And what we saw as an analysis was that the safety and efficacy of thrombectomy uh, was equal to that of the zero to six hour time frame. Okay, uh, imaging criteria, why, why do we do imaging criteria? What's the purpose? It's really simple. It's uh, the exclusion of patients, not the inclusion, the exclusion of patients. And there are really two types of patients that we try to exclude from thrombectomy, and they are patients that are unlikely to benefit or patients for whom thrombectomy may be harmful. So talking about the early time frame window, uh, there's no superiority of imaging modality used. So we can have our non-contrast CT. We love our aspects, 6 to 10. There is a tendency to move towards a dichotomization of the aspect score. So no longer do we need to say aspect 7 or aspects 8 because the patient is going to go to thrombectomy anyway. So we draw the line at 6 and we start saying yes aspects or no aspects. Uh, the MR diffusion, aspects 5 to 10. Uh, the multiphase CT and geography with collateral imaging. Of course, a moderate to good score for collaterals is what we're going for. Uh, the last part, the advanced imaging, isn't really necessary in the early time frame uh, window, but we are looking for a small core, so less than 50 to 70 milliliters and significant penumbra to core mismatch. So the late time window, unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have the ability to use artificial intelligence so far. Um, and I uh, had a talk with my department maybe two or three weeks back uh, exactly about e-stroke and, um, and the benefits of that. However, for us, for now, um, we still go by the Dawn and the Fuse criteria uh, with the CT perfusion and the, and the MR diffusion perfusion. Um, the problem with Dawn and Diffuse, however, they're highly restrictive. So uh, me it means we have limited generalizability. And that means that they can't be applied to every single patient that comes to our stroke unit. And what's the problem with that? And I'll give you an example from a single center study. Uh, we have elbow patients that have good clinical outcomes after thrombectomy. However, the single center showed that 70% of them were Dawn and Diffuse ineligible which means that patients who had a good clinical outcome and benefited from thrombectomy might not have received the treatment if we were strictly following Dawn and Diffuse criteria. 
So um, this is sort of going towards the future, uh, maybe possibly with a lot, a lot of question marks. And this is the visionaries. So uh, CTMRI aspects three to five. Can we talk about that? Uh, it all started with ECAS 2, where, where we showed that um, IVT functional outcome was not dependent on baseline aspects. And then we had Diffuse 3, which had um, an analysis showing that the thrombectomy had the same effect for aspects less than 8 and more than 8. What about core volumes that are more than 50 to 70 milliliters? The latest Hermes collaboration of all of these showed individual good clinical outcomes at 90 days with aspects 5 to 7. What about aspect zero to four? And infarcts of more than 30% of MCA territory. So this is what we have to, we have to follow uh, in order to draw some sort of line to where we are ready to go with thrombectomy because symptomatic ICH is a huge risk, especially with, with these numbers. So uh, about the location of the large vessel occlusion, there's lots of clinical data supporting large vessel occlusion uh, intracranial, uh, extracranial ICA, M1 and M2. These are obvious. M3, we don't have so much data yet. It's still, it remains unclear. Same thing goes for the anterior cerebral artery. And this is where, this is what we need to do. We need to do risk assessment. Some of it might be uh, preoperative, some may be intraoperative, uh, but looking at vessel perforations, vasospasm, way, the way we manage vasospasm. Okay, uh, really shortly about stroke severity, because it's more of a neurological than a radiological topic. Um, how much disability is disabling? Of course, the NHSS score. When we first started out, we wanted uh, to have preserved patients, so Mr. Clean started with a really low NHSS score of two. Um, escape and extend had no threshold, but required, quote unquote, disabling symptoms. And what we practically use is an NHSS more than six, of course, uh, according to Swift, Primer, Vascat, and Diffuse. And now I've written here change slide because we're going to change topic a little bit and we're going to start talking about the moral of the story. So we have to keep in mind that we're treating patients. We're not treating numbers. We're not treating images. Um, so what nobody really talks about, the American Stroke Association says that patients most likely to benefit from thrombectomy have a pre-morbid MRS of zero to two. Okay, does that mean that MRS three to five is not good enough and they shouldn't receive treatment? Um, Perlman did an interesting analysis. He went after stroke survivors and patients in, um, patients in nursing homes uh, that had notable pre-morbid impairment. And he, and he asked them how they felt about their diseases. And I quote this, um, states worse than death. So uh, the patients had, um, were in opposition of life prolonging treatment. They did not want, if something should happen, they did not want treatment to occur. So does this mean that we should alter the guidelines in some way? Should there be a pre and post um, quality of life assessment? So uh, we bounce on the question of science versus holistic medicine. <laughs> so uh, back to the future. Um, the questions that, are, uh, that we have to sort of look forward to answering, hopefully in the near future, what's the lowest aspects that we can, we can safely start and, uh, to implement thrombectomy? What about the largest core volume? The ACA and the bezel are artery, they still remain unclear in terms of mechanical thrombectomy. Should we do general anesthesia or sedation? Is there really a space for discussion there? What about pedi pediatric stroke patients? We don't talk about them at all. And uh, the final topic is, uh, it's pretty interesting, neuroprotection before or after mechanical thrombectomy. Um, we've started to show really slowly through new studies that um, there is a thing called, uh, there is a th such a thing as neuroregeneration. So that sort of puts a question on what we calculate as a core volume. Is that really a core volume? Is there reversible tissue in what we conventionally call dead brain? So I've laid out the current recommendations in a, in a little bit of an easier format to read. Um, in terms of imaging, in the six hour time frame with moderate to good collaterals, small core, and significant mismatch, of course we do a thrombectomy. In under six hours, but lower than six CT aspects, it may be, or a core volume more than 70, it may be reasonable to do a thrombectomy. Six to 24 hours, so late, late time window of an ICA or M1 who meet Don and Diffuse, of course, this is a yes. And six to 24 hours, what without Don and Diffuse, like I said, with a single center study, it may be reasonable. Uh, time from onset, in select patients up to 16 hours and up to 24 hours 
Um, it's good to keep in mind that one is from uh, features on set and last known well, whether, uh, and up to 24 hours, we're talking about only the last known well. So wake up strokes do not, uh, do not factor there. Uh, the location of the large vessel occlusion, ICA, M1 and M2, of course. Uh, M3 to be considered on a base to, uh, case to case. And the stroke severity, uh, NHSS greater than six in anterior circulation, we can go ahead with the, with the thrombectomy. With less than six, with disabling symptoms, I quote, uh, such as isolated aphasia, we might be able to do. Um, it may be reasonable to do a thrombectomy. And the last recommendation concerning age, elderly patients, it's actually not contraindicatory uh, for thrombectomy and based on a couple of studies, actually. Uh, what remains unknown, however, is patients with an MRS greater than one in this, in this age group. And that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this critical inter uh, uh, part. I think it is so important to show we are not treating numbers, but there's a patient behind yeah, it. Exactly. And we really do tend to just take all the patients together and then come up with a conclusion that should meet every patient. Of course. And um, <clears throat> we also we just had a, a case where the patient has a modified ranking score of four, is 50 years old. Theoretically, that patient is excluded. Yeah. If you ask further, the patient has just fallen, had a fracture of their leg, <laughs> thus has a modified ranking exactly, score. Exactly, yeah. Also, who are we to judge if someone is disabled yeah, and is not able to care after themselves? Is it not worth treating that patient? So I, I think exactly. we have to be very critical. And um, I love the list of questions, questions, questions yeah. that you'd put. I will add one more, and that is eloquent area. Ah, yes, so yes. we tend, uh, yeah, so um, we tend to look um, sort of which area of the brain is affected. The hand area we can see. Do you yeah. think that will be important? Absolutely, in the absolutely. Future? That can be. That can, that's really important. Um, there are scores um, for other pathologies that include the eloquent area, whether it's affected or not. So it's something that could be incorporated into into stroke yeah. uh, triage. Yes, uh, of course. And, and I will add one more part when you were um, mentioning that in, was it 18% where the patients would not have been eligible? 70%. Uh, 70, 70, it's a, yeah, it's a single center. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, single. So very interesting because we always tend to take the imaging result of a perfusion as the holy grail. As exactly. in radiology, we know never trust any images you haven't forged yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, the problem is that perfusion imaging, um, so the Buffalo group say within the first four hours, I will be more conservative, say in the first two hours, does not work. Exactly. So um, if you, and in wake up strokes, you do not know how old it is. And we would have excluded so many patients from treatment if we had followed the perfusion image. If you show, and I think That's that exactly is meant, exactly yes. um, reflected here. So in those cases, I think it is really important to take the combination with the um, dead aspects area yeah. Um, yeah. together. Yes. Yeah. Uh, superb presentation. Really loved it. Thank Let's you. look at the individual. Let's look at collaterals. Collaterals. Yeah. I think the new, you said the slogan. <laughs> <laughs> collaterals. The collaterals is brain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brain. Yeah. Yes. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs>